Welcome to another edition of the conversation series at the United Nations University. My name is Sabine Becker-Thierry. I'm the executive officer at UNU. And today I'm joined by Andrew Sharp to discuss the silver linings of the COVID-19 crisis in Asia. Andrew is the deputy editor for politics and economics at the Nikkei Asian Review. Um, he's a long-term um, journalist. He's covered previously economics and politics at Bloomberg, um, the Tokyo office. He's also a long-time resident of Japan. He's an avid observer of economics, politics um, in Japan, but also in the wider Asian region. He is um, involved as well with the Foreign Correspondents Club in Japan. Some of you might know him. He's currently the, the vice president. Um, Welcome to you and you, Andrew. Welcome, Sabine. Thank you very much for having me. It's, it's an honor to be here. Now, the COVID-19 crisis started in Asia. As we all know, in, in China, China earlier this year, it has since expanded all across the globe, but also covered um, most parts of Asia. Uh, for you, Andrew, uh, who, who you are observing uh, on a mm -hmm. daily basis, these developments now, including COVID-19, um, the spread of the virus, the response that the different countries in Asia have been um, administrating. Um, how would you categorize the COVID situation we are in now here in Asia? Okay, so it, it really depends where you are. I mean, India, um, it has the fastest growing caseload of any country in the world right now. I think there's about 83,000 cases over the past 24 hours. So things are getting really bad there. My colleagues there tell me that you know it's very difficult for them to go out and do anything. It's it's a very serious situation. And in parts of Southeast Asia, while you know Thailand, Vietnam are faring reasonably well, we're still getting a lot of cases every single day in places such as Indonesia and the Philippines. And into my patch, into Northeast Asia, um, you know, it's faring much better by comparison. Uh, daily cases in China are low. They're virtually non-existent in Taiwan. And while in Korea, South Korea, there's been a spike recently, uh, you know, starting from that cluster at the church, um, in Japan here, the numbers appear to be slowly, slowly coming down. But as this virus has shown us time and time again, it's impossible to write it off until perhaps we get a vaccine. You already mentioned um, that there are different, you know, it depends very much on where you look. It depends on on, on various elements. Uh, but when it comes to the response that global crisis um, is, is what we are observing that different countries are mm -hmm. and orchestrating to, in response to the crisis um, of COVID, what factors do you think have played a role in how the response has been handled in, in Asia? And you may, you may, you can zoom in on, on, on some of the countries you're closely following. Sure, sure. Um, I think, you know, there's many, um, obviously in Asia situation, especially in, in this part in, in um, Northeast Asia, things haven't been as bad, certainly as, as in the West or in Russia or, or in um, Brazil, for example. Um, you know, places like South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong had the experiences of um, outbreaks such as SARS or MERS recently. And as you know, there's a, a mask wearing culture here. So this appears to have made a difference. Um, plus there's a kind of a more of a group mindset of people are more generally, of course, not everybody inclined to obey rules or recommendations from governments or authorities. Um, so it's hard to know. Plus healthcare here as well in this part of the world, it's generally good um, compared with other places and it's affordable. You know, especially compared with places such like such as the US or India. So there's a lot of factors involved here, I think. Uh, no one has an answer. I don't think anyone will have a, an answer for a long time. But I think there's cultural factors, plus there's um, medical factors here as well, plus, you know, organizational factors from governments. Randy mentioned India and um, other countries as well. So not all countries, if you look more widely at uh, yeah. the region of Asia, have been um, able to keep the numbers um, that low. Yeah. Um, but I don't want us to go too much onto the health uh, topic and numbers, um, as this is very, I think, widely uh, accessible, but also widely debated. Um, what yeah. I'm interested in is to hear more about the economic effects. And mm -hmm. do we see economic effects also as, you know, as, as diverse 
um, across the region or where, where do you see um, the current trend? Right, well, it, pretty much everywhere has been hit. Um, certainly some places more than others. I think it seems the, you know, the, the recession or the contraction in China seems to be over. Taiwan's getting, getting through this, for example. But only, you know, this week, India reported a, a contraction of 23.9% in the second quarter. Malaysians, Malaysia's GDP fell a similar amount. Japan fell 27.8% in the last quarter. So we're seeing, you know, it's, it's differs everywhere. I mean, back in March, I think, I don't think we've seen the end of this by any means. The second quarter was bad. But back in March, the World Bank warned of a third shock to, the, to Asia's economy after the US-China trade war and the COVID pandemic. And, you know, it's saying in its report then that poverty across the region could increase for the first time in a generation. Um, and while this hasn't materialized yet, there's also the issue of financial markets. We're seeing stock prices going up at the moment, but at some point they could become crippled, the financial sector could become crippled, capital markets, c countries could build up debts. Um, so future generations could be paying the price of this pandemic for a long time to come. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a very diverse effect and we're not going to see the last of this for another decade, I don't think, economically. Yeah. Um, speaking of the financial markets, in, in some regions um, in Asia, but even in beyond, um, there is even a tendency, I mean, there's, there's rather upswing than, than a downward trend right now. How to, how to explain that? How to fathom financial markets. <laughs> <laughs> if I knew that, I wouldn't be a journalist. <laughs> um, it's, it's hard to say, isn't it? I, I, think, um, I think this huge amount of money coming in from central banks, liquidity, it has helped um, prop up uh, stock markets globally. Um, perhaps the fundamentals of the companies that people are investing in are relatively solid, so people aren't running away from them. But it, it's hard to know where this is going. And at some point, there could be a crash. We could keep going up. If I knew, I'd be Warren Buffet. So thanks. Um, going back a bit Sorry. more to the <laughs> to, to the economics um, elements um, on, of, of the COVID crisis. I mean, despite you know current maybe positive pockets here and now in some financial markets, mm. the picture you've been painting early on economics is not particularly uplifting. Yeah. And if we look at Asia, Asia has been playing quite a significant role as a powerhouse of industry, industrial production over the past decades. It's playing an essential role in the global supply chain. So now global production due to COVID is facing tremendous obstacles. I mean, we mm -hmm. have heard of delays um, in car parts not being delivered, factories having to be closed or temporarily or even put on hold or for, for already had to shut down. Um, borders remain closed or risk being enclosed depending on how the, how the pandemic evolves. So for the globalized economy, um, what do you think will change as we continue on the, on the virus, um, but as we also hopefully move into a post-virus situation? Sure. Um, I think the pandemic has accelerated a trend, a trend of, comp of, of companies, you know, re-examining their supply chains, perhaps accelerating the shift, also spurred by geopolitical issues away from China. We're seeing companies like Google and Microsoft getting out of China, moving production to Southeast Asia. Japan's even subsidizing companies to move back home or to Southeast Asia. Um, there's a whole bunch of companies there um, that are doing this. So, and as for the travel issue, I mean, we're slowly starting to see um, countries opening up their borders again. Obviously, everyone's being very cautious, don't want um, second, third waves, whatever you call them, of, of infections. Um, but I think it will get back to some kind of normal, but perhaps with people producing um, goods closer to home than before. All this, I, I'm afraid, is still not particularly positive or optimistic in terms right, of... Right, 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 right. Despite all that, is there, for you, is there a silver lining of COVID in, in Asia? For, you know, whether this come, whether, it, whether this uh, is referring to, to systems we have in place, whether this is health systems, whether this is the economy, whether this is working patterns. Sure. sure. 
Um, I think there are a few bright spots potentially. Um, one is the potential for greater sustainability. You know, as I mentioned, the company's reshoring, bringing production home, reducing the amount of goods being flown around the world. Obviously, it's good for you know carbon neutrality, etc. Um, food, especially, people are definitely going to eat more local, locally produced products than they were before. So that's going to help, you know, the whole um, with the whole climate change issue. Um, going on to working practices, like you mentioned, you know, the presenteeism culture of companies in East Asia, you know, it's long impeded more flexible working practices, um, but it's changing fast. Certainly, the company that I work for and many others I, I know of around in in Tokyo and and beyond. You know, they're actively encouraging people to work from home, allowing people to spend more time with their families. And this is accelerating. I can't see these companies going back to their old ways. I don't think the, the employees will allow that to happen. So I think that's most, a most definite thing. Another benefit possibly, you know, is that governments and people and organizations are seeing the importance of reliable and affordable health care for all. Um, so we're likely to see more investment and more focus on that in the future. And I think just on a personal level, I think it's helped all of us. We've all had different stories to tell with this um, pandemic. We've all got different situations, of course. But it's helped us all to reassess our lives a little bit, um, our relationships, our working practices, the things we do every day, how we do things. So while we miss all the fun things like going to sports events or concerts or, or whatever, it's helped all of us in some way, not always for good, but you know, it's helped us all though to focus on what's important in our lives. So that might ultimately feed through to many other things to be the most important um, aspect, most positive aspect of this, of this pandemic. Now, some of the, the elements you just provided, especially on the working culture, yeah. Um, you know, of course, very interesting to, to, to witness and observe, especially, for example, in, in Japan, where we are both located. Um, but these are ultimately for if, if these were to stay, I mean, this, this is a tremendous overhaul of deeply ingrained systems, working patterns. Um, how optimistic are you that some of these new ways of working will actually stay with us? And to what extent once we are you know, we are no longer um, in, 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 as we are now, needing to re refrain from, from meeting physically and so forth. So once one of these like tougher measures are, have been eased, will there really be uh, a new normal in, in Japan, for instance? Well, people who know Japan will know that Prime Minister Abe, I mean, soon to, soon to be former Prime Minister Abe, um, you know, he's been pushing the last three or four years for these working practice reforms to get people to leave the office early, to get people to spend more time, you know, with their family or out socializing, you know, helping people, you know, get away from this, this presenteeism mindset and try to increase productivity. I think this has just accelerated the whole push by probably five years to a decade or something. So I don't see it changing at all. I've seen several companies here, um, like closing down their offices or, or like slashing the space in half. Um, so clearly the um, companies themselves are looking at, you know, having a more flexible workforce because they can also save costs on office space. Um, so I think this is here to stay. Although, you know, one of the downsides naturally is that is the communication. While it's great to talk on Zoom or other platforms um, and you don't get the chance meetings you don't get you know just going to get a cup of tea or something and bumping into a colleague having a chat and you know as a journalist oh you talk about something and you get an idea for a story just from a casual conversation so there's less casual conversations going on which, which, is, which is a real shame um, but it is allowing people to spend more time at home and working, you know, hours that suit them better as well, which is, which is good. And I think there will be the flexibility and, you know, the opportunity to go into the office or go into the, you know, whatever workplace it is and, and engage with people. So I think having that option is, um, is going to be really, really big for going forward. I don't see this going backwards at all. It's speeded up things by close to a decade. Now, the, 
the current situation, for instance, in Japan, but also in many other um, Asian mm. countries, is that cities have have been expanding and expanding um, through to work being very much concentrated in those centers. Um, in Europe and other parts of the world, there is discussion, there are already trends being observed that there is a decentralization trend mm -hmm. or, or at least um, efforts um, underway of people moving away from the huge agglomerations. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee anything similar in, in Japan or other Asian countries or have you already observed any similar patterns? Yeah, we're seeing signs of this. Um, I think it was this week, the uh, recruitment company here, Pasona, a big, big company, uh, many people, you know, employs many people and helps many people find work. They're moving their headquarters from Tokyo to Awajishima, which is down in Hyogo Prefecture. It's a big island. Um, um, it's not a small place, but it's well away from the big, you know, urban center metropolis of Tokyo. So that's one place. I heard about a, a tea company moving the HQ from quite a big tea company, makes a lot of the green teas you see in Japan, uh, moving the HQ from uh, Tokyo to Niseko in Hokkaido, the famous sort of ski resort area. So we're seeing some small signs of this now. So I don't see why I think other companies are going to follow, whether at some point they realize they have to be back in the city to, to, to do business or not, I don't know, or they'll find a way of having some units in out in the regions and you know others in the, um, the big city. I mean, gov several governments and administrations in Japan over the last couple of decades, they've always talked about moving functions of government you know, into different cities and you know, like other Asian countries have done. Um, but it's never, it's never worked out. People have always just wanted to stay in Tokyo. This could be start of this trend, but obviously it's, it's very, very early days yet. And moving HQ is, is a big, big step for a, a company. Meanwhile, and Japan might be a, a slightly different maybe in that regard, but meanwhile, unemployment rates are are increasing and in, mm -hmm. all across I mean, the globe, but they, of course, yeah. all in Asia and uh, in, in other countries where not, these rates might already have been higher than, for instance, in Japan. Um, I would like to um, give also our audience uh, the opportunity to, to ask questions. And I understand from my colleague, uh, Basilio, who's with us, um, that we have already received quite a lot number of questions from the audience. So please, Basilio, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sabine, and thank you, Andy. Yes, we do have quite a lot of questions. Um, we can't get to all of them, but I'll give you a few here. Um, do you think Japanese financial institutions persuading governments and citizens to encourage travel via the go-to travel campaign to prevent market stagnation during the pandemic could be a probable reason for future economic stagnation in Japan? Hirona Matayoshi from Yokohama National University. So the, you're talking about this government stimulus for the, the travel, uh, travel, the go-to travel, um, exactly. but it might have a knock-on adverse economic effect. Right. Um, well, I think at the moment, it's just a short-term measure. Um, obviously, the travel industry has been hit harder than, than most industries, with most people being stuck at home or in, this, in their towns or cities. So at first, obviously, on the economic side, it would be good for the regions, naturally. But long term, uh, whether, I mean, this is obviously a market about, about this is all a question about you know, market interference from the government, uh, whether that will kill off this competition, et cetera, et cetera. That's yet to be seen, of course. We'll know this answer in a couple of years. Um, and I'm guessing at some point we're going to find out whether this has sucked out the competition out of the um, hotel and leisure market, and whether um, you know they, they get, they'll just sit there, you know, getting fat on the government subsidies, or whether they will, you know, somehow come out of this leaner um, and you know more competitive. It's um, it's it's capitalism. It, it, we'll have to see how that goes. Thank you, Andy. Um, this question comes from Nandini Singh from Punjab University. Do you feel that there will be more gender and in income equity in the coming decade after the pandemic's effects have settled in? More gender and income equality? 
inequity. Yes. Yeah. Oh, in inequity, sorry. Um, well, it's, there's been a lot of reports saying that the pandemic has hit uh, women harder than men in, in terms of the uh, employment situation, um, because I think a lot of more women had to uh, work in places where you know, they, they, they had to stay at home and that the childcare, the children couldn't go to school, etc. So, um, yeah, it's possible. Plus, of course, the in, on the lower income side, a lot of the low income jobs, such as, such as construction working, etc., or, or retail, I mean, they need a physical presence. So they've been hit harder already. Whether this going forward will, will change, again, I, I'm no soothsayer here. I can't have a definitive answer. Um, but if it does open up more flexible working opportunities, um, for, for example, for women to be able to work from home or mix, mix and match between home and uh, the office, that might be a positive thing down in the future. Um, and in terms of these general sort of low, um, lower income workers, it's, it's hard to know, but um, I guess, as always, people adapt and change and economies change and people will train and do something else, change careers or something. So long term, yes or no, I, I haven't got a straight answer, to be honest. Um, I wish I had, but I think it might be positive in terms of certainly in, in, in terms of gender equality going forward but again that's yet to be seen thanks for your thoughts Andy. Um, another interesting question i see here is uh gentleman takahito kamta a postdoctoral fellow in sofia university is asking about the effects of covid 19 on public transportation systems changes of people's mobility in capital cities in asia which capital city in Asia do you feel would uh, experience the most change or improvements to their public transportation systems after COVID-19's influence? That's a tough question. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I think I read a, a report today that um, once things get back to you know, a so-called normal, that Tokyo is going to um, it's gonna run its last trains earlier. So they'll, they'll shut the transport network down at 11 p.m. or so rather than midnight or so. So obviously it'll have an effect there. I mean, people may be commute, commuting less going forward. And somewhere like Tokyo, which is totally reliant on its, on its train network, might be, be hit really hard um, by, the, by this. Or it might just have the point that because people are working at home, it, it, they just have to run less trains. So I'm guessing it's where people, it's cities where people commute more by public transport, by buses, by trains, than in cities where people would use cars more. So let's see. Thanks, Andy. Uh, switch a little bit to education. I have a question from Vo Ram Yoon, a master's student at Harvard Graduate School of Education. Um, the question is, to what extent will the pandemic transform the learning experiences of students in East Asia to prepare them for possibly bleaker economic prospects, or perhaps oh. not. <laughs> well, obviously the issue now is with the education is, is the online uh, learning. And if we're talking higher education, I mean, a lot of people, most people who are doing higher, in higher education now are, are studying you know, online. And, you know, friends of mine who are teachers at universities saying it's a very frustrating experience for both the lecturers and for the students. Students obviously feel they're not getting the full value for their money because they're just getting online Zoom calls all the time. Um, lecturers struggling to keep a class engaged online when you've got 50 students in front of you all in little Zoom boxes. So in the short term, I think the learning experience and, and those, I think also the most important thing is people who, the actual physical, like people, like science students, engineers need to be physically sort of engaged in labs, etc. Um, I hear in some universities they have mock-up law courts where people can practice, you know, future lawyers can practice, um, practice law. So things like that, students, I mean, people will adapt and get around them. So long term, I think employers will look at these students and know what they've been through because they've been through similar things themselves with their company. 
So even if they're perhaps lacking one or two skills because they've not had the opportunity for actual physical engagement at university or, 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 or beyond, I think employers will understand this. And so going forward, I don't see it changing too much. Yeah. A hopeful message. Um, I, like I think we have time me. for one more or one okay. or two more, depends on how this goes. But uh, a business analyst in Malaysia, Adlina Arshad, uh, says that uh, with the current pandemic and most people uh, living with a new norm, we're seeing the rise of the gig economy, especially in Southeast Asia. However, people who work in this industry are not um, uh, are particularly vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, decent insurance or pension unions, et cetera, are not available. How, in your opinion, should the government um, regulate, if they should at all, this phenomenon? Right. Okay, well, I'm not gonna prescribe any prescriptions for governments here. That's not really my <laughs> position. Um, I mean, the gig economy was, you know, this, this was a situation before the pandemic. Yeah, it was becoming a big, big issue. I mean, we look at Southeast Asia, we look at Gojek and Grab, and all these, you know, thousands, you know, you go to Jakarta and the streets are green in like motorcyclists, you know, all wearing, both, both those two big companies wearing, wearing the jackets and the helmets. So that it's everywhere. Um, it's become, yeah, it's become what people do if they don't have anything else to do. They become a Grab driver or something. No, no offense to Grab drivers. Uh, <laughs> they're very, very good. But I think this the regulation of gig economy is something that's causing headaches everywhere in the world, um, from Europe to the US to Asia. And whether this changes it, I guess, of course, there's been more and more, I mean, there's going to be more opportunities for gig, in the gig economy because of the food deliveries, et cetera, that we're, we're all using um, from time to time these days. So I think it's just a, the, the same big question about the gig economy before COVID and after COVID is that, you know, some countries are trying to make these employers, I mean, so some governments are trying to make the employers actually, the workers actual employees. Some are quite happy to let them just be part-timers, you know. So I think from country to country, you're gonna see a whole different range of regulations um, coming in. And I think that was happening before this. I think, it, again, this might just be an accelerator, which we've seen in other, other parts of the economy as well. But you know, for a trend that's going on now. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, we actually have just a little bit of time, so I want to end it um, on a rather uh, open question, which is, how do you feel uh, the current um, succession uh, after Abe will go, and who do you think um, may be the likely successor? Right, okay. So I think the election is going to be in a, in a week or two's time, and it looks like the ruling LDP, all the, the big shots or the faction heads, they're backing Yoshihide Suga, um, who was at Abe's number two for nearly eight years, the chief cabinet secretary. And so he does look to be a shoe in right now. So he's going to come in, he's been speaking, he's been saying he's going to just come in and just to prevent a political vacuum. And he's going to carry on the so called Abenomic. Uh, Abenomics um, economic policies that Abe puts in. Uh, what he does to tweak around the margins there, I don't know whether he's just going to play it safe or he's going to push out in his own way. It's, it's far too soon to say, but it does look like to be Suga. Um, but again, in a year from now, the ruling party will have to hold another presidential election. Um, so obviously he's got a year to kind of prove himself. So we'll see how he goes over the next year exciting. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew Sharp. I think between the gig economy in Indonesia, <laughs> um, COVID, good and bad in a sense of very varied um, response, very varied picture, and it continues to evolve depending where you look at and depending on the day you choose. Um, and now ending with um, Yoshida Suga, I think we've covered a lot of ground in a very short <laughs> time. I would like to thank you very warmly on behalf of the United Nations University for sharing your thoughts and, and your observations as you um, look at the continent on a daily basis. And thank you all who, who provided comments and in the chat function. And uh, please join us again for the next conversation series at UNU. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.
Thank you.